Hello, thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Catherine Valentine, and I'm the head of politics at Substack. Tonight, we are celebrating Mehdi Hassan and the launch of Zateo News. Yes. Woo! We have a lot to celebrate, which is the fun part. Six weeks ago, Mehdi announced that Zateo was coming. This is just an announcement, he said. Wait until April, he said. That announcement became one of the biggest launches in Substack history. <laughs> and today, the very first episode of Medi Unfiltered, Zateo's new streaming show, debuted to over 150 thousand subscribers. The flyers in your hands, printed this weekend, couldn't keep up. There are Zateo subscribers in all 50 states in 195 countries. Yeah, talk about global impact. Global impact. And this is just the beginning. The next generation of media brands are being built on the Substack platform, and we are so proud to have Zateo on Substack leading the way. And with that, let me invite to the stage Zateo founder, Mehdi Hassan, and tech journalist, Kara Swisher. I, ha I have my glasses on, largely because it's on brand right now, but, <laughs> um, but it was sunny here a second ago, so um, I will remove them summarily in a little bit. But I, I'm here, you asked me to do this. I'm perplexed as to why you did. Um, but let's- <laughs> So am I. Exactly. So let's talk about what you're doing because a lot, you know, I have been down this road. One of the things we did many years ago was All Things D. We did events, conferences, essentially a blog, but a version of Substack before it existed. Talk a little bit about why, why you did it the way you're doing it and how you think of new media. There's a lot of small new media companies, whether it's Puck or Casey Newton or, or various things. So talk a little bit about your theory of what you decided to do after MSNBC. So I, I can't pretend, and thank you all for coming tonight. I appreciate you all and appreciate your support. Thank you, Cara, for doing of this. Those of you, I'm sure you're well aware, Cara kind of chews up and spits out interviewees. I like to do interviews, so I'm not in a very comfortable spot here being the interviewee. Um, <laughs> Theory is a big word, Cara. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I could say that I had a great uh, kind of grand unified theory for this. Mm -hmm. I don't. What I do have is an instinct for what people want right now, mm -hmm. uh, what I can offer, and where the gaps are in our market, in our industry. And some people think it's a bit crazy to start your own media company uh, when you know some of the great brands, online brands, are shutting down, laying people off. January was to borrow a line from the former president, a bloodbath for the mm -hmm. media industry. Mm. Um, but I actually have a lot of confidence in what we're going to do at Zateo because we are going down the subscriber model. You heard Catherine mention uh, the, sub, the, you know, the substat model. For me, leaving MSNBC, there were many options. I could go be employed somewhere else. I could go do freelance work. I could go join Substack as an individual like a Matt Iglesias or a, mm -hmm. a Heather Cox Richardson. Or I could try and build something that is bigger than me, but is supported by the same business principle. So one thing we didn't want to do is just go, all right, we'll just go YouTube heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, you've seen Piers Morgan and you know, Talk TV have now switched. They're doing so well on YouTube. Yeah. They're focusing all their attention. My worry is, uh, you know, one of the issues I care greatly about is Palestine. And there is a lot of shadow banning going on. There's a lot of censorship going on. The right spent the last two decades telling us about cancel culture. What they didn't tell you is that the greatest victims of cancel culture are people who speak out on Palestinian issues. So for me, I was trying to judge the landscape and say, where could I do have the most impact with financial viability and without having to worry about an advertiser coming after you or mm -hmm. a big tech company trying to shut you down? And you know, Elon Musk, uh, someone you know well, uh, someone I'm not a fan of, but even Elon Musk you know, has trouble with his advertisers, the richest man in the world. So mm -hmm. little on me is going to have much bigger issues. So sure. the idea of being able to be self-sustaining. And there was a moment um, a, few, a few months ago where I was at a, a, a public event and a lot of people came up to me and said, wherever you go, we'll go. Mm -hmm. And A, that was sweet. B, it was great for my big ego. And C, I thought this, it was a kind of right. clarifying moment to say, all right, well, why not? Why not try this? So the reason why advertisers 
don't advertise on Twitter is because it's a terrible place to advertise to start with. Secondly, it's almost offensive on a long way. But they can decide what they want to do. Of course. So in that case, it's slightly different than what you're talking about. But when you're when you're thinking about your business plan, how, how precisely are you going to make money? So the, the really, really cool thing is today's launch day, and we've already been making money for six weeks, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to all the support from our global subscribers. We, <laughs> we, we were the... I think we're the first platform on Substack to get to 10,000 paid subscribers in, I think we did it in three days. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to 100,000 100, free subscribers in six days. Um, it was a kind of phenomenal launch. We didn't expect it. I certainly didn't expect it. I was super cautious. I remember saying to a friend of mine, if we get 500 paid subscribers on day one, that's a win. He said, no, it'll be 1,000. I said, Psst, don't be so optimistic. Uh, we got 5,000 on and day one. And what do you charge? What is the charge? That people so know? we do, we, I, I love it. I love people calling it out from the, <laughs> that's a true subscriber. Uh, if you pay yearly, Mm -hmm. uh, it is six months a month, so $72 a year for mm -hmm. um, a regular membership. For a founding membership, it's $500 for people who really want to support us. We've had a massive number of people uh, mm -hmm. come in as founding members, way more than we thought. In fact, we offered founding members uh, a signed copy of my book. Cara, mm -hmm. by the way, has a New York Times bestseller out. You should all read it. Um, and my book came out last year, and I said, hey, I'll sign some copies for the few founding members who join up. Uh, we've had so many hundreds of people sign up with founding members. We've now taken that offer off the site because I simply can't sign uh, so many books. So. We are making money. Um, we are on course today. I'm sorry, making money or making revenue? We are making revenue. Excuse revenue. me, you're okay, right. Got it. But okay. we are on course. There's a difference. To, there is, there is. I, I'm new to the business world. I'm, I know well, nothing about profits, business. Profits, losses. Indeed. Costs, I, I, I did an economics degree 25 years ago and forgot everything. You, the, have to, you have to make more revenue than you spend. Let me just give you that piece of advice. <laughs> this is why we invited Cara Swisher <laughs> to lead the discussion tonight. So we are on course. Um, I was hoping to break even in the first two years. Mm -hmm. uh, if our current trends continue, you, then we're on course to break even before the end of this year and maybe even make some money. Mm -hmm. And then that includes staff or what? I'm just I, having done yeah, this so a we, lot. So we, so we have a small team. We're a startup. We have, we have staff. We have contributors that we rolled out today. Uh, many of them are paid contributors, are doing uh, engaged in paid relationships. We have some <laughs> great names. I don't know. Who saw the list of pay, uh, contributors we rolled out today? Some great names. Um, uh, fantastic people, Naomi Klein and Cynthia Nixon and Greta Thunberg and uh, Rula Jibril, Spencer Ackerman, you know, Pulitzer Prize winners, New York Times bestsellers. We are very pleased with the team we put together, but also we are renting a, a really good studio in DC. I don't to know do if people video. saw our trailer. Right. Uh, it's very, you know, I didn't want to do something. I went to MSNBC for three years. I went to Al Jazeera for a decade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I appreciate production values. I didn't mm -hmm. want to go and just be uh, the guy in his basement. Tucker Carlson in a basement. Not that there's anything wrong with being in your basement. I'm in fact building a basement well, there's studio. There's a lot to be. Well, I'm being, building a basement studio a myself. Long. I hope yeah. better than Tucker Carlson's. Uh, but we also <laughs> wanted to have the production values. It's a values. low bar, but go ahead. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. No, I agree with you, you're not gonna, you know. Tucker Carlson, Elon Musk, we're really hitting all the names tonight in the first yeah, 10 okay. minutes. Um, so yes, we, we are, we're spending money on where it needs to be spent, on mm -hmm. production values, on editing, on, you know, I flew to London to do a bunch of interviews that we're going to release next week, some really good people, in-person interviews. So we're trying, you know, we're a small, crappy startup. We're also trying to spend money but where we think it should be But you're focusing on video a lot more yes. than text. Yes. Video is your entire... Not entire, but it's, we are video, uh, video first, I think mm -hmm. it's fair to say. I'm known for doing TV interviews, TV monologues, viral clips. Mm -hmm. So it made sense to be uh, video first. One of the reasons we came to Substack is because they're one of the few newsletter platforms that can support the kind of video we want to do. We dropped our first show today, Mehdi Unfiltered, uh, which is an hour-long show based on my old uh, mm -hmm. uh, MSNBC show. It's you know monologue, big interview, panel discussion, uh, big guests, and uh, you know we dropped that today, and we're going to see how that does in this new world of. So uh, rather than this on YouTube, you're doing it on Substack. We're doing it on Substack. So. We will release parts of it on YouTube, and, but we're still, we're Cara, we're still figuring out the mm -hmm. balance between free and paid, paywalls versus no paywalls, YouTube versus Substack. It's all very fluid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was an Atlantic piece this week from uh, Richard Stengel, mm -hmm. former Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, former Time Magazine, editor, saying democracy dies behind paywalls, mm -hmm. uh, making the case for getting rid of paywalls in an election year, which is a very very strong argument. Mm -hmm. Ironically, Atlantic put it behind a paywall, uh, uh, hilariously, for a while, and they, I think they removed it. Mm -hmm. But look, we're having that debate internally, me and my team. Mm -hmm. what, what, what should we paywall? The podcast, the right. show, contributors? What, what, what are people willing to pay for? So you'll have a show, it'll be made into a podcast. No, we have a show that dropped today called Mehdi Unfiltered, right. which is based on the old cable model. Mm -hmm. We have a podcast we're launching next week, mm -hmm. uh, which is a uh, which will Maddie be really unfiltered. No, so so <laughs> because because 
because I'm not the egomaniac that some think I am, and when I say okay. some, I mean my I wife and kids. I find nothing wrong with that, um, but go ahead. I started Zotero because I wanted it not to be the Tucker Carlson network. I could have very easily done Mehdi Hassan network. I decided right. to build something broader than me. Same with the output. So we have a podcast that will be me, but with a rotating bunch of guest hosts from the worlds of entertainment, comedy, movies, talking about politics from a different bent. We're going to have some really interesting names. Okay. Uh, the first big one we're rolling out at the end of this week. So keep an eye open for that. And then we've got these Who contributors. We'll find out at the end of the week. Why? Come. Because we're staggering our all right, launch. All right, all right, okay, it's a business fine. thing. You stagger okay, it out. You. you get more subscribers, and more yeah. revenue, and then you make Thanks a profit. Thanks for the help on that. I know. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so we've got a bunch of shows coming out. Um, and uh, the contributors are also going to be doing their own uh, columns. We've got um, some really good... We've got John Harwood, mm -hmm. uh, ex-CNN, ex-CNBC. He's going to be writing a, a fantastic weekly newsletter on the presidential race called The Stakes. Uh, which is borrowed from Jay Rosen's line uh, mm -hmm. about the importance being the stakes, not the odds. Um, fantastic insider voice. We've got the outsider voices. We've got, um, as I said, Naomi Klein's going to be doing a conversation about her view of what's going on this year called Unshocked. So we are trying to provide a broad um, uh, and your, 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 offering. And your viewpoint, and then you'll do events, presumably? That Once we get bigger, yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, this is an event. Substack hosted it, but definitely. Sure. I, lo I love doing live events. I love so, doing stuff so in front of audience. So two, two final questions, then we'll get some questions from the audience. One is, obviously, there's been some controversy about around Substack. Someone who's one of my mentors, Casey Newton, who I really pushed hard to leave regular media to do what he's doing to create platformer has left Substack, so several people have, because of uh, platforming of, of, uh, of I guess it was neo-Nazis in his case. But talk about that. So Substack was an interesting place to come to because it does have a bit of a rep as being, because of its because of its kind of free speech. It's mm -hmm. annoying because the right now kind of own this free speech language. So if you're a free speech platform, you identify with the right. Mm -hmm. I had my concerns about that. I had long conversations. I do my homework when I try and make decisions. So Casey's a great journalist. I love the platformer. I love the reporting he's done, especially on Twitter. But a couple of things. One is, sadly, where can you go in the tech world right now where there are not Nazis? There's a whole broader conversation that we can okay. have about uh, the rehabilitation of Nazis in modern America. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I spend a lot of time on Twitter, which is now the world's number one home I don't, but for white supremacists. Well, you're, you're still on there, aren't you? Have you quit? Not really. No, I haven't, because I've been there since 2007. I'm going to yeah. wait them out. I've been, oh, go ahead. <laughs> so I've been there since 2009, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll wait them out together. I'm just addicted, so I can't get off it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's the, it's the world's number one home of kind of white supremacists, neo-Nazis. The owner is, encourages it. Facebook, Meta, Threads, you know, Zuckerberg Empire that incited a genocide in Myanmar. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go down the list. It's not great, right? right? Um, YouTube with its own kind of uh, white radicalization issues. So where do you go if you're a purist? Not many places. Interestingly, on Substack, on the specific Casey Newton thing, I do think Casey may have oversold the story because when I looked at the numbers that I was given by both others and by Substack, I think it was six accounts he identified that he provided to Substack, uh, mm -hmm. five of which they took down. I think those five accounts, I think had 100 free subscribers, mm -hmm. like 100 active Substack free subscribers, which is less than the number of people in this room. I think Substack has 35 million active subscribers. So for me, it was... All right, 0.0001% problem. That is a problem. You know me. I'm very outspoken against Musk, against Nazis, against the platforming of extremists. But for me, it wasn't as big an issue as I'd initially thought. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, and by the way, we were talking about this in the green room. For me, the cancel culture issues are very much right now post-October 7th mm -hmm. around Israel-Palestine. Mm -hmm. As someone who feels very strongly about this issue, has spoken uh, a lot about this issue, I need to be at a place where, right now, pro-Palestinian journalists, pundits, commentators, I know people in the audience who have endured this, have been shadow banned, have been censored, especially uh, on Instagram. And uh, the advantage of Substack with its kind of hardcore free speech ethos is that you own your list, you own your content, you can leave any time, and there's less chance of pro-Palestinian content being targeted as well. All right, last question. You were trying to create something for the left. You've talked about that. And the right has been very good at yes. creating these things. One of the things, many years ago, I interviewed uh, a bunch of right-wing media people, and they were zeroed out of mainstream media. And so they went on to create, whether it was Fox News or whatever. I think it was Ralph Reed I was interviewing maybe 20 years ago talking about this. Talk about why, why you think it's important. There hasn't been a lot of success. There's been a lot of success on the right. Very much. Although right now, if you're looking at statistics, right-wing media is falling off a cliff right now because there's too much of it. It's Yes, the right-wing... Rage is hard to keep going for a while. <laughs> Although we've got an election to keep people in right. rage for. Yeah, I've seen the numbers and they have fallen more on the right, and mm -hmm. that's good news. Mm -hmm. um, but um, 
I think in this kind of models, mm -hmm. the right has done very well. And I look mm -hmm. at Ben Shapiro on the Daily Wire. Sure. I look at Barry Weiss in the Free Press, which is a, on a Substack platform. Uh, I look at Tucker Carlson, although I haven't seen his numbers, so I have no idea how well or badly he's doing. Um, Megyn but Kelly. Megyn Kelly on, on, on radio and podcasting. It has been very successful for them. And I look on the left and I don't see anything equivalent. I see the Young Turks have done a very good job on YouTube. Uh, my old colleagues at The Intercept do great journalism, but if you've seen the reporting this weekend, it's not great in terms of the cash flow going on there. Um, and traditionally over the years, Air America and other places mm -hmm. tried doing liberal media. It didn't work out. So, <laughs> yeah, not a great precedent. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it works both ways. Gap in the market. Did it not work out because others couldn't do it right, is mm -hmm. the question. And I think what I have that others didn't have is that I have a global following. I'm mm -hmm. not restricting my audience or my content to just America. 50% mm -hmm. of our subscribers come from the United States, 50% from the rest of the world. Um, and also, I am someone who's always straddled Cara, uh, Cara the mainstream and the alternative media. I was at Al Jazeera English and at MSNBC. I was at the Huff Post and The Intercept, but also at the BBC and Sky News. So I've done all those different things, and I think I bring that experience with me, and that allows me, hopefully, to keep my feet in both camps. You know, I'm doing Zateo, but later this week, I'm going to go on on CNN, where I know you're a contributor, mm -hmm. and chat about stuff on CNN. So I'm not going to... The problem with a lot of left businesses and a lot of left sites is they've self-marginalized very quickly or been marginalized, and I am not going to allow that to happen to Zateo. Okay, questions from the audience? Uh, one or I think two. there's a microphone that Lara right has here. there, if anyone... Right anyone here? Would... Here? Yeah. Why don't you stand up and say who you are? Hey, Mehdi, uh, congratulations. Ishan First question is from a reporter, not a <laughs> subscriber. Well, I'm technically a columnist. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well said, Ishan. Uh, Ishan through the Washington Post. Um, just to pick, pick, piggyback off Kara's uh, last line of inquiry, do you see yourself, as you move forward with Zeteo, being in kind of daily dialogue, combat, with this kind of world on the right that exists out there, the, plot, the Ben Shapiro's, et cetera, Barry Weiss's, et cetera. Um, and, and do you also have a kind of theory or plan for building up a younger audience? You know, this is something we agonize about every day um, where we are. Um, do you think you'll have an appeal to the kind of, you know, do your own research, Jim Bro? crowd out there or other demographics that may exist unfair but yes uh, that um, that don't necessarily read publications like mine or yeah, don't want that's to a great question because I mean are you, is, is are you being the counter it's good to have a fight just so you know that's oh, how it, well, my site got huge always, by fighting I mean, with I've other spent people. the last 15 years fighting too much yeah yeah I, do fight. I, mean, I wrote a book called win every argument I, I like to fight yeah. um, the I mean look the problem with the fighting with that side people I used to I spent you know, I've been a journalist now for over 20 years. I've been a public figure for 15 years. I love debating. I've just agreed to do a, a big debate on Gaza in a, few, in, a, in a few weeks' time. But I am careful about these days who I debate with. And I said this last year when I was doing the book tour. You can't just debate with anyone everywhere, right? There's a lot of bad faith actors out there. There's a lot of gaslighters. There's a lot of freaks and grifters. Like, if you tell me tomorrow, go debate Candace Owens, I'll say, no thanks, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro, mm. So the problem is on the right. And you, I don't know if you saw this essay that the Free Press published from an NPR guy about how we've lost the right wingers. Yeah, mm. because a lot of the right wingers are living in a fantasy land, not in a reality-based universe. So I don't know how you debate a lot of those people. So yes, I'm going to pick fights on big issues. You know, Iran, Israel, big substantive issue, the election, the future of democracy, voter suppression. But you know, the kind of fake cultural crap, you know, Tucker Carlson and the green M&M, no, I'm not going to waste time with that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just below us, just to be honest about that. Uh, to answer the second half of your question, I'm old. I'm 44 years old. I've got gray hair to show it. Uh, but um, I've always been, uh, because I like to fight on social media, and, I know, and I've always had a kind of thing for social media. I've understood uh, what goes viral, what people like to see, what people like to read. I have managed to get a younger audience than most of my fa fellow cable hosts. Uh, back when I was at MSNBC, I had one of the youngest audiences uh, at the network uh, on social media. I had quite a big reach because of the young folks. On TikTok, we amassed a half a million followers for the Mandy Hassan show on TikTok in less than a year. I think we had a bigger TikTok audience than most other cable shows, including primetime shows. So I've been there, done that. I think, and I'm not as kind of cynical about young people as some in our industry. I think a lot of young people care about issues like Israel Gaza is a classic example. Um, we've seen it with things like abortion rights, uh, equality issues. I think you've got to engage in the issues that young people want to hear about. We're all happy to engage in the issues that old people want to hear about. And I think it's also a style and a tone. Um, as you say, like, you, look, 
Ishan writes a fantastic newsletter. I urge you all to sign up to his newsletter because his newsletter engages with weighty issues, but he does it in an accessible way. It isn't rocket science. I'm no. sorry, it isn't. You also don't necessarily have to assume that young people should be your audience. That's, I find that kind of ridiculous. We have a huge audience. I don't care. Is You can keep paying until you're dead, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think we sit around and worry so the a, much. The AOL mindset. Remember well, AOL? Did they AOL. I just don't care who's... It's, no, I agree know, with that. No, no, I agree with know. that. My, my thing is broad as possible. Broad right? Audience. Broad as possible. One of the reasons I went to MSNBC and people on the left would say to me, you know, oh, you're MSNBC. Yeah, it's a broader audience than most people on the left mm -hmm. got. I loved being at The Intercept. I, have, I know people from The Intercept here tonight. But it was a no-brainer to leave The Intercept and go to the MSNBC because mm -hmm. I was getting a huge audience mm -hmm. and I was able to bring to MSNBC viewpoints and guests that you never saw on MSNBC. I will take this to my grave, right? I got an email one day from Noam Chomsky, bless him, and he said, in 25 years, Mehdi, no one's ever invited me on MSNBC. <laughs> And I was like, great, if I do nothing else in my life, right, I'm the guy okay. who got Noam Chomsky on MSNBC. All right, two more quick questions. Um, this woman right here. Hi, youth. Hi, I'm the youth. I am youth. Um, <laughs> Thank you. My name is Mayoshi Smith. First of all, congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so much um, for all the work that you're doing. Um, I am a millennial voter. Um, I am very politically engaged. Um, I run the communications for If Not Now. And um, thank you. Let's give a round of applause to If Not Now. Thank you. Clearly, we're not busy. Um, so I have a question okay. from If Not Now. Um, given your understanding of the media, what would you suggest as we move forward as an organization to try to grow our numbers? Obviously, we are looked at a lot as anti, we are anti-Zionist, um, but we are looked at a lot as um, anti-Semitic. And we wanna know from you and your opinion how we can grow our numbers and how we can appeal to Zionists in the country that are committed to misrepresenting us and misunderstanding us. Okay. And also, okay. Okay, what are you saying? Gonna, we want to get to one of the, go ahead. That's right. a good question. Go ahead. Uh, look, um, I'm never going to give advice to If Not Now. Uh, if Not Now and JVP have done some fantastic work uh, since uh, the bombardment and siege of Gaza began. And I think it's been very inspiring to see uh, young Jewish people standing up for universal values and equality and human rights um, and doing it, you know, in such an inspirational way. Um, and I think I genuinely it would be very arrogant of me to give your group advice on what to do here. I will say this, when I see young Jewish protesters being arrested in Germany right now, and the German minister saying this is Islamism, I find it hilarious. Uh, when the DNC was protested and people said it was anti-Semitic and it was Jewish protesters, I found that hilarious. So look, I am uh, inspired and in awe of the work that JVP and If Not Now do. I think in general, there is a messaging problem, obviously, on the pro-Palestinian side. I think the media in general structurally has some issues here, but I think things are slowly changing. I think we're seeing a lot of change. We have some fantastic journalists uh, who have spoken truth to power, who have humanized the Palestinian people, which is what and anyone who watched my show today, I began the show today talking about how the media dehumanizes Palestinians. And we have excellent journalists, including one in this room, my former colleague, uh, the one and only Ayman Moyuddin, who has done more than most to humanize Palestinians on American television. Okay, um, back there, and then we'll get to you. These, there's one back there and one here, and that's all we have time for, right back there and yeah, then right here. You can ask him the Bond exhibit below sure. your questions. Go ahead. Um, hi, Mehdi. This is all incredible and inspiring to see this launch. I'm curious, there's been a lot of hypocrisy on display in right-wing media recently about free speech um, yes. and cancel culture in general, and we've seen it most recently with Ben Shapiro on this whole conversation about the fire of Candace Owen and what views are considered beyond the pale and how that's not really cancel culture. And I'm kind of curious in your view of the Teo and the collection of people that you are bringing together, if you have given any thought about what diversity of views within that platform would look like, and if you are thinking in terms of what a quote unquote Overton window looks like um, yeah, what is for you. Your Overton window? That's a great question. Um, so I have thought a little bit about this, not enough probably, given the speed at which we put this together. Um, Car and I were talking at the weekend uh, before this, and I said, look, people have asked today when we were all at the Kubernetes, have you not got a right wing voice? 
And I said, no, I, there's enough places for right-wing voices, right? That's not, I don't, we, um, there's no lack of spots for right-wing voices, whether it's on MSNBC, CNN, Fox, or whatever, New York Times op-ed page. Um, so uh, there's no shortage for that. So I'm not looking for right-wing voices, sorry. Uh, but I am looking for broader conversations uh, on the liberal left, on the center left, on the left, um, both globally and in the United States. That's gonna take time. Right now, the two issues I'm focused on are Trump and the election and the future of democracy in America and Gaza and the ongoing genocide and the war there. And so for me, I'm trying to get different views. We have two fantastic uh, Palestinian uh, voices. One of them is, lives in Israel. He's gonna be writing a diary, Diana Butu. He's gonna be writing a diary about what it's like living in Israel. I bumped into a conference recently. She said, I go to get eggs and the eggs have, we stand together against Hamas or something on the eggs. Like, I was like, this is fascinating. I wanna read about this. We don't hear about the life of the one fifth of Israelis who are Palestinian. So she's writing a diary column for us a month on that. But yeah, look, it's an ongoing conversation. This stuff shifts. Um, I, I haven't really put as much thought as I should to into how broad do we go, how narrow do we go. It's ironic you mentioned Ben Shapiro because obviously you need to have your hygiene test, right? What you're willing to tolerate and not tolerate. Ironically, unlike some people, and I know some people on the left and Palestinian movement was weirdly sympathetic to Candace Owens, please don't be. Um, I have no problem with firing Candace I think she said outrageous things. But what's so you interesting- So you won't be hiring her? I won't be hiring okay. Candace Owens. Sadly. Although I'll tell you what, some people have suggested I hire her and I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, um, but, You'd regret that. But, I, but, but it's interesting that Ben Shapiro did fire her after going on and on about cancel culture because it's funny that you can fire her for anti-Semitism, but if somebody engages in anti-black racism or Islamophobia, then you defend and you say they shouldn't be touched. Okay, last question right here, very quick, and then we'll get to the next. Do you have the thing? She's coming around. You can just... Yeah. Making, no, that's, listen to me. Okay. Let me give you a piece of advice. Everything is content. So you let them tape it. Yes, okay. we're taping it. This is going on Everything, YouTube. everything is content. So hello, Mehdi. Thank you for the shout out to The Intercept. I, my name is Prem, I work at The Intercept. And I'm curious, when you imagine Zateo's relationship to readers, consumers, subscribers, how do you imagine it? Because for instance, for The Intercept, you imagine sort of movement, journalism, agitation, yes. equal opportunity, corruption, call outers, crooked media, um, someone I know that you were recently yes. co-hosting with you imagine them as kind of mobilizing voters, yeah. uh, encouraging them to register, to make calls, to get their friends to call. So what do you consider to be the grand vision of your relationship and your colleagues' relationship to, to your subscribers? That's a great question, because fan base, is, I've talked to you about that. The idea of fans is so important to what you're making. That's how you were successful. So what do you, how do you look at that? So for me, as I think about, because I, as I said at the start, I don't have a grand theory and I don't have a grand vision. I'm building as we go. But what I do at the, at the center of it, I think in terms of kind of fans or supporters or people mm -hmm. who back me and like what I do, both kind of ordinary people, but also colleagues in the media, um, you know, I do a lot of combative journalism. I do a lot of adversarial journalism. I do a lot of tough interviews. On our first show today, I've interviewed Ehud Olmert. It was a lively interview. Um, that is what I'm gonna put at the center of what we're doing. Now, I don't expect all our, all our contributors to do that, obviously, they, they do it in their own ways. Um, and you're gonna see that in the, some of the output that comes out. Uh, I think Naomi Klein has her own way of shaking things up, as you well know. Um, so I'm looking forward to what she does. Um, but that is at the center of it. Yeah, and Intercept was founded with that precept. I joined the Intercept in 2017. And that was what appealed to me at the Intercept, the, the model of adversarial journalism. This idea that in our American media culture, it's a little too cozy, it's a little too deferential, it's a little too clubby. And I definitely want to break that up. And I do think people say, you know, Zateo's impact on the left. I don't just want it to have an impact on the left. I want it to have an impact on the media landscape in America. I want to be, when I was at MSNBC, people said to me, colleagues, on and off the record, publicly and privately, like, oh, we're now doing what you're doing. We're booking that guest you booked. We're now asking questions like you did. And I'm not saying that to brag or anything, although it's nice to brag. Uh, but I'm saying it's in the, that for me is important. I want to be able to say, look, we can do things differently. You can do an interview like this. You can do a monologue like this. And I do, that's what I want Zateo to be. I want it to be best practice in some ways as well. Now, do I have a ground theory? No. By the way, one very, very quick thing. Uh, Prem Tucker reached out to me when he was at university and asked me for advice on journalism. And I basically was like, it's bad, it's bad. And then I didn't hear from him again and I didn't see him again. And now I see him at State Department briefings grilling Matthew Miller day in, day out. So <laughs> he's a fantastic example of young people really trailblazing yeah. in the media. And he didn't listen to you at all. And he didn't listen to you. I had nothing you. to do with it. Good. It's a self-made man. Well, good luck. I love uh, entrepreneurial media, as you know. It's one of You're, my... It's, uh, I've done you it have for, been a trailblazer in that space. So I, I would say yes, and I would say more, more of it. And it's really great to see that. And, but listen, costs, revenues, okay? 
<laughs> we'll, we will speak in 12 months. You, me, and my accountant. No, no, no. That's the only thing that matters. Okay? You, me, and the accountant will get together All right. in 12 okay. months. All right. Good luck. Cara, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Give it up for Cara Swisher. <laughs> thank you so much. So... Now we are at the uh, second book. Thank you so much to Cara. Thank you all for coming. It really means a lot to me to see you all here tonight and people are going to be watching this later online. Um, so now I get to be in the more comfortable chair where I much prefer to be, where I get to ask questions, not answer them, which is uh, what I love doing. Without any further ado, joining me now is the Democratic Socialist from the great state of New York, a politician so well known we refer to her by three letters, AOC. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> And I don't know if you can, can make it up. You can make it up here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congressman, thanks so much for coming tonight. Of course. Thank you for having me. Um, we were local, not far from Congress, so we, we, we <laughs> arranged it all. Um, this is a new media company. Cara's been talking to me about media, theory, vision. And let's talk about old media. You have had a very unique relationship with the media. When I thought tonight we talk about Zateo and media, the future, who better to talk to than a politician who has a very uh, unique relationship? In fact, two months after you arrived in Congress, the AP ran a story headlined, Hero or Villain? Ocasio-Cortez remains a media fixation, uh, in which they cited a study showing stories about you online got more shares, more comments, more likes than even speaker, then speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, how has your personal experience of that intense media spotlight shaped your own view of our mainstream media? Oh man, I mean, tremendously. And it's, it's actually not just the extremely intense experience of having to be under this inordinate amount of scrutiny and attention through media because it was incentivized yes. by you know, all of this fervor, but also equally informed by the total absence and lack of coverage of our primary before I won as well. And the total absence and squashing of stories and you know, the, the silence that uh, went on. I mean, I, I was actually quite radicalized afterwards by all of this media narrative that happened after I won where people said, she came out of nowhere. No one saw her coming. I had hour-long interviews with Politico, the New York Times, many of the same outlets that claim that I came from nowhere <laughs> had actually interviewed me for hours and decided not to run with these stories. And so uh, going from that silence to this just almost like this frothing at the mouth, I mean, articles about when I got my hair cut, I mean, things that do not matter to people, right? Um, but was incentivized because all of a sudden it was good algorithmically or for, you know, whatever it may have been for them, uh, was very informative. And also, you know, that was also a time where I found it very important for me to at times bypass these channels and use my own voice. So you, you just preempted my, my next question, which is you do go on a lot of late night comedy shows, you do Instagram lives, mm -hmm. you quote tweet at certain journalists if they're saying something you disagree with or that you think is wrong. Um, is that you trying to control your own narrative, trying to cut out the media middleman to go directly to your voters? And if so, what do you say to critics who say it's not healthy in a democracy for politicians to be able to just bypass the media? I think it's not healthy in a democracy for there to be false narratives that are allowed to be perpetuated because they're incentivized by one you know, political force or another. And this is not to say that there's no place for journalism. Of, I mean, of course, it's, it is a, a bedrock of any functioning democracy. Um, but it is to say that there can't just be one gatekeeper of information. And as a public official, I should be held accountable by the press. And I also believe that I have the right to tell my own story as well, and the public can weigh you know, all of these facts for themselves. But I, I do think that experience of having to look at myself through the funhouse mirror of the narrative war that happens on, you know, on ink and paper, it's not always the same objectivity that is often claimed. No, right? that's for sure. And um, I mean, I remember, I remember, uh, I actually didn't see it live, but I, I, because 
my election results were announced and it was just pure chaos. But looking back, there was like two years afterwards, I saw this clip, I think of M NBC breaking the news. And it was like, rabid socialist defeats. <laughs> you know, I mean, all oh, but it, it's, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But it, it was treated as though it was this national emergency. Like defeats the next heir to the Speaker yes. of the House. Our, you know, this country is going to hell in a handbasket. And it, it was this just fervor that was so beyond so, what I think was the truth of the situation. So given since then you've called out the media as you are tonight uh, for false narratives, if you had to change one thing right now about our mainstream media, about how it covers the news, the politics, the election race, what would it be? Um, I think it's too beltway focused. I think that it is so, at least our political news is so deeply shaped by how people feel here. Mm. And, I mean, and I know this is kind of a cliche thing to say, but it truly is. Uh, I, I mean, I feel this way as, when I see how my, a lot of my colleagues' views are shaped. Um, a lot of people here, you know, because of the fundraising model in Washington and our elections, you spend all day, I mean, I don't, but you spend all day uh, most people spend all day on the phone, four hours, dialing for dollars. Yes. And, but when you do that, that process is actually hearing what people's views and opinions are. But then you're hearing the views and opinions of people of a class that can afford to cut a $2,500, $5,600 check like it's nothing. And so you get this very narrow perspective about what most people think. And I think there's a similar phenomenon often that happens with our political coverage, where people, and very often the narrative is, was someone running too far to the left or too far to the right, as opposed to did someone have a more functional campaign? Was their operation better or not? Which is never, ever, ever discussed. If someone loses, it's because they were too radical. Not that they didn't knock on doors yeah. or run a functional or competent operation. Um, and so I, I think sometimes the one thing that I, I would change would be for people to operate and also perhaps cross-pollinate reporting more. Um, I think having a political Outside of DC. Mm -hmm, Although that has its dangers too. You had the New York Times for four years saying, let's go talk to Trump voters in a diner, mm -hmm. which didn't really work out for us either. That has a, yeah, but it's so, all political reporting, yes, right? That's true. So let's go beyond the beltway. Gaza, in mm -hmm. my view, has been a major media fail. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the failure to hold Israel to account for what it's doing, but the failure to humanize Palestinians on our screens. And today, uh, in the opening monologue for my new show, uh, I referenced an intercept study which showed how the words massacre and slaughter are used almost exclusively for Israeli victims of Palestinian mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. and not Palestinian victims of Israeli violence. And I happen to think that's not, that's not just dehumanizing, it's racist. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, A, do you agree with that? And B, do you think it's deliberately done? I do think that um, that there absolutely is. I mean, institutional racism informs all our institutions. It is subconscious. It is foundational. It, that is what it is. And it's not to say that there is like this one individual that at the top of an organization that has explicit intent. It's just. This, I mean, is coverage misog it, like coverage leans misogynistic by default. It leans, you know, racist by default. The use of passive voice when a Palestinian is killed, the use of passive voice when a when a black person is yeah. killed by the police. Passive voice is reserved for the marginalized, and these practices are normalized. And so I. I think that who or what is deemed controversial is often at the core of these unjust decisions and coverage. You know, what is deemed controversial often tends to be issues relating to race, to gender. You know, these are what is seen as hot button, but half of our country is female. You know, we have a huge plurality there are people of color. It's interesting you mentioned the passive voice. That has been on display for the last six months. Like, Absolutely. there was a BBC headline about a man who lost, I think, 103 members of his family, and the headline was just, 
He lost 103 members of his family. Where do you lose them? Down the back of a couch? Like, Absolutely. tell us who killed them. And Absolutely. it took 33 paragraphs for the BBC to suggest Israel may have killed 103 members uh, of his family. You were an early voice in Congress calling for a ceasefire. You did an interview with me on MSNBC uh, in which you talked about war crimes in Gaza very early on, and you rightly won a lot of praise from pro-Palestinian activists for that. But some of them were upset that you didn't use the G word right at the start, mm -hmm. the genocide. Mm -hmm. And then on March 22nd, you give this very fiery speech on the House floor in which you say, quote, if you want to know what an unfolding genocide looks like, open your eyes. How did you get to that point? How hard a decision was that for you to accuse Israel of genocide in Gaza, given how most of the rest of your congressional party are not with you on mm -hmm. that issue, mm -hmm. of course? Well, you know, I think... Um... To me, this is not, and I know for most people, all people, uh, this is not a term that is thrown around, that we throw around. We are talking about an accusation of atrocity on a scale uh, that is not to be seen and should not be seen ever, but we're talking about a generational uh, crime of massive scale. and. That has very specific parameters of intent, of how, we're unfo how it unfolds. And, um, and it also, I think, that conversation is also within the context of my role as a decision maker and how I try to operate and apply pressure to stop all of this from happening, and particularly halting the US enabling of this. And so for me, I believe that it was very important for if I to speak to this, that I had to not say this to check off a box, but to create a legitimate, weighty argument that would have influence inside and outside. And after but right now Yes. As of right now, tonight, you believe the United States government, the Biden administration, is complicit in a genocide? I believe that the ongoing famine that we are seeing and the forced famine of Gazans constitutes an unfolding genocide. And if we continue to enable that, uh, that the, the complete withholding of aid, the starvation of nearly 2 million people, this is will, will be what have happened. And we've seen this in Rwanda, yes. in Bosnia, so you yeah. said in your speech, you referred to Joe Biden at the start as a decent man. Mm -hmm. But then later in the speech, you said a genocide looks like, quote, decent people who do nothing or too little too late. Is that a reference to Joe Biden, that he's a decent man who is doing nothing or doing too little too late? I think when we see how genocides unfold, they happen not just with intent, but they happen with, with exactly this kind of... Um, on th this, this almost invoking of uncertainty. We need to see more, we need to wait. No, it's not until it is too late. Yes. And when I think about my tipping point, that's part of what had compelled me, is that I did not, especially as we saw these reports come out about what the, what the runway of famine would be, what the toll would be if we waited just days. Yeah. I had felt, I do not want to say this after it is done. Okay. Because then it will have been too late. And you talked about enabling. Our enabling constitutes mainly arms sales. It's a big part of our enabling. Um, number one, did you ever imagine that Nancy Pelosi would come out for conditions on arms sales of all people? And number two, post this weekend with the Iranian attack on Israel, what are, we, what are you saying to colleagues who say, well, of course we have to arm Israel mm. now. What are you saying to the... To the Jared Moskowitz's mm. and Josh Gottheimer's. Well, on, on your first note, it, I do think it's important for people to take a, a pause and realize how much of a dramatic sea change there has been. The, the mere notion or suggestion of conditioning US military aid to Israel was unthinkable seven months ago. Un politically unthinkable, never in the history of the United States have we had a conversation like this. And the fact that, as you mentioned, that even Nancy Pelosi 
is now signing on to letters about this. We have to understand the drug, I mean, this is a generational change. Yep. Um, secondly, uh, on your, on, as to your second point, what we say to folks um, who resist this is that if we want safety in this region, we have to condition US military aid, which we do to every country in the world, by the way. It, it's actually stopping the exemptions instead of creating one that we're talking about. And it's the creation of this exemption that has, de that has contributed, in my view, to destabilizing the region. Because when we say you can do anything you want with this, and as we've seen when there are leaders in the region who will do and will break uh, international law and norms, um, we, are, we are having a hand in that. And I, the good news about it is that I do believe, I hope, that we are getting to a point where this is no longer a fringe position. More and more people are... are do, you, do you worry that Israel, as a critic of Israel, do you worry that Israel is trying to start a war in the Middle East to distract from Gaza, trying to start a war with Iran? There was the attack on the consulate in Syria, which the Iranians claimed they were retaliating for. Mm -hmm. if, you know, how worried are you about an Israel-Iran war that America gets dragged to, that Biden gets dragged into? I can't speak to the intent. I don't know if it is volatile decision making. I don't, it, it is difficult to generally get into the mind of, of not just one individual, but a cabinet, a, a government that has its own internal uh, incentives as well that they are responding to within the politics of Israel as well. But what I do know is that this is not safe. And what I do know is that whether intentionally or unintentionally, we're, this is an escalatory environment. And our responsibility, in my belief, is to contribute to the de-escalation of, of what is a, a very volatile situation. What and I believe the president made some actions this weekend, and it actually showed and demonstrated the value of conditions, saying we will not support this. And what it led to was a de-escalation. What do you say to a young progressive or an Arab American who says to you, I just can't vote for Biden again mm -hmm. after what he's enabled in Gaza? What do you say mm -hmm. to them? I mean, I think every, everyone comes to this prospect and this conversation with a different history, different background, what they bring. You know, for an individual Palestinian American that has had their family killed, there is nothing, I mean, I, I am not here to, to lecture anyone. I also think that um, this election is more, in my, in my personal view, I believe this election is about more than the president. And also, it's not just one election that's happening. We're having hundreds of elections. Yes. The balance of Congress, the balance of the House, the balance of the Senate, and the presidency. And I have a vested interest in protecting democracy, not just here domestically, but globally. And it isn't, I, I truly do not believe this as, as a lesser of two evils type of situation. I think about what conditions do I want to be organizing under in the next four years. Yeah. You, we can look at both of these individuals oppositionally as well, depending on what issue you have. But I would rather, even it, even in places of stark disagreement, I would rather be organizing under the conditions of Biden as an opponent on an issue yeah. than Trump, who is not, he, he seeks to dismantle American democracy. And I am taking that personally very seriously yes. because we will not be able to, to organize for any any movement towards anything if we are facing the jailing of dissidents. I mean, this is the kind of authoritarianism yes. that he threatens. Fascist. And we have to take it seriously. Well, we are at Zateo. One of the missions is to stand up for democracy and not pretend that it's a partisan issue. Um, thank you so much for taking my questions. We have a little bit of time to take some questions from the audience. Do you want to wait for the microphone to come to you? Stick your hand up and we'll try and come to you. Uh, in the corner, right there, right at the back. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Oh, sorry. Good evening. My name is Zeki Barzinji. It's a pleasure to be here to see you all. 
Um, I'm half uh, Arab American, half South Asian American and Muslim. And um, my question kind of builds off of Mehdi's question, which is a lot of folks in my communities tend to be immigrant uh, Muslims, tend to live in the suburbs, tend to be on average um, pretty well off. I hear a refrain from them saying things like, well, when it comes to policies, Democrats and Republicans pretty much are the same. Mm. And therefore, there is disinterest, there's dissatisfaction. My personal view is that for people who live in the suburbs, for people who are on average well off, it's true. The policy differences between the parties are not the same, or are the same. Um, but we have to dig deeper than that. And what I've always loved about the way that you communicate policy differences is that you break it down in a way that really reaches and transcends people's own personal circumstances. So what would you say to communities like mine who have this visceral reaction right now to thinking that both sides of the political spectrum are the same because they only look at a very narrow set of policies as yeah. the determining okay. factor? Well, I mean, I think there are certain policies that could be more different if you're gay. Really big difference between the two parties. If you're a woman that cares or a you know, or a person with a uterus that cares about having bodily autonomy, there is a stark difference. And by the way, if you're in a place, if you're from a state like mine, like New York, just because we live in New York State, you know, out we have the right to an abortion at a state level. If they pass a national abortion ban, it will overturn a New Yorker or Californian's right to be able to access reproductive health. And people act like these are social issues, but they are not if you are over half the country. Because having a child against your will, being forced to have a child against your will, is one of the most profound, profoundly economically shaping things that can happen to you in your lifetime. To whether you're able to access health care or not as a trans person, is it, I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's, sometimes these things are, are treated as pet issues, but they are some of the most deeply transformative economic forces in a person's life. Um, and so I don't think, I mean, this, it's real. It's, it's real. It's not just a wedge issue. Yes. It, is, it is our life. So, I, often, I often hear people say, we survived Trump once. We can survive him again. I'm like, no, literally half a million Americans died from COVID. Yes. Many of them didn't need to die. Literally, Americans did not survive uh, Trump. Should we take another question from the back? Yeah, you got a hand up. Microphone's right behind you. Hi. Um, I, the question I had to you is, I've, I've been watching you throughout the whole time you've had your term, um, but I often hear the discourse at work is, yeah, we kind of get where she's coming from. It's just the way she delivers that message. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to call that out. That's just sexism, misogyny. I mean, I don't need that part to explain, but how do you respond to, how do you think we should respond to somebody like that? And I'm gonna pause you just there. Mehdi, I wanna ask you a slight question okay, as well. Uh, briefly, which is, how do you reach out to the Muslim population to get them out to vote mm -hmm. and be interested? Yeah, um, I, mean, I, I mean, it's true, a lot of it is institutional. I mean, like, I mean this conversation started with institutional mis misogyny, sexism, et cetera. Um, first of all, I can't be anyone but me. And I made a deal with myself when I first ran for office and when I won. I needed to know what, uh, on what conditions I would leave. And for me, the moment that I could no longer be myself, I could no longer have this job. I made that deal with myself. And so, you know, when people tell me that, it's, I don't know what to tell you. I'm a Puerto Rican from the Bronx. That's what you're going to get, and that's what it is. But I think on the other part, too, I tend to, when, when some of that unconscious bias comes up, I, the most effective way that I know is to respond to it with a question, which is, you know, what about that do you think is inappropriate? Or what about that do you think is inferior? Um, and prompting a process of self-reflection. And a person may respond defensively in the moment, but I often find a couple weeks later, or sometimes months later, they'll come back and they'll say, you know, I really gave thought to what you were talking about, and I actually think I've, I've reframed it. But we've seen questions like this happen all the time, right, around so many people, and about your boss, or, or someone you work with, and it's really, that's that structural 
kind of dismantling of, of bias that we all have to do. And just in answer to your question to me, I mean, I, two things I would say. To, I speak to a lot of Muslim crowds. I've been speaking to Muslim audiences for the last few weeks uh, while traveling and promoting in, in, in Ramadan. I would say, number one, um, half the world's Muslims uh, don't have a right to vote. So those of us who do and take it lightly, uh, we're really letting down the entire global community uh, just, from a, just from a global perspective. Um, and number two, uh, someone asked me earlier, does my faith inform my, before the events, I was talking to someone and they said, does your faith inform your politics? And it does. Uh, as a Muslim, my politics are all about standing up for the downtrodden, my neighbors, the community, people other than myself or the suburbs uh, who need help. And therefore, uh, that wasn't a dig at Zeki. Zeki doesn't support the suburbs. But um, my point is that vision that says, just think about yourself, for me, is a very un-Islamic vision. And therefore, it's my Muslimness and my Islamic faith that says, go out, vote, organize, mm. protest, mm. be politically engaged. Let's take one last question, and we're out of time. <coughs> gentleman there at the back. Oh, I know that gentleman. That's Wajah Ali. OK. <laughs> this will be a curveball. All right, here we go. Uh, congratulations. We may not want to end on this question. Uh, congratulations, Mehdi. After this. Uh, I promise I'll not embarrass you with this question. Uh, but a question for Congresswoman AOC. We're in DC right now, corridors of power, and with the threat of Trumpism, we still see a framing of both sides, mm -hmm. which I believe is an asymmetrical framing. And with corridors of power, whether it's media, whether it's business, whether it's uh, politics, we still hear, well, you have to reach out, and just do both sides analysis. And I am curious, with the threat that is looming, and you could disagree with me, where, what do you recommend for the Democratic Party? How much do you reach out? And how much do you say resist? I mean, I, I, I know everyone's going to say, well, of course you're going to say this, it, which is leaning towards not just resisting, but telling the truth. I mean, there is a certain, dis, there is an enormous dishonesty at times when we talk about both sides. The reach for an equivalence where there is none is fundamentally dishonest. And I think we need to be clear about that. This idea that we're going to, oh, um, he's fascist and he's kind of old. I don't know. <laughs> That's dishonest. It's dishonest. And in like... my view, it, is, it actually belies really awful intent. The because, far left, the far left wants healthcare, and the far right likes Nazis. I just oh, I mean, I, I mean, I see this too when people. I mean, they, they try and convey you to MTG. How do you feel about that? She's not on the level, okay? <laughs> like that's just that's just what it is. No, I mean it's not. It's but whatever. But here, here's what I do think is that I actually do think that more. I would say your your establishment. Democrat or the, the establishment, however we're calling this now, but we all know what we're talking about, is that I actually think there's an increased realization of this. Because in the last several electoral cycles, the number of persuadables has narrowed down to nearly nothing. And if you're in a position like mine, where it's all a numbers game, where am I going to get the votes that I need to win? Like, let's just get brass tacks about it. That's how 435 people in the House think. Where am I going to get my numbers? And what they've seen is that that persuadable amount is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's nearly, it's nearly nothing. And so they know now that now, increasingly, every race is, a, is about turnout, base turnout. You have your people, and the math is going in this direction more than it ever has before. Before, you would see this disproportionate lean you know, towards the right, I would say, within, within Democrats, because those persuadables were more reliable voters. And so you don't know how they're going to vote, but you know they are going to vote, as opposed to this base that sometimes they vote and sometimes they don't, and it's unreliable. You don't know if they're actually going to vote or not. And so trying to lean to these folks when you don't even know if they're going to turn on election day was actually seen or calculated as, as risky, as opposed to the less risky approach of trying to appeal to someone and win someone that you know for sure is going to turn out. And we see that reflected, I think, historically, in this both sides framing from elected officials. But now, there's a, there is a shift in that understanding, because people are looking at their numbers. And the numbers of persuadable voters have dramatically shrunk. 
And so people now understand that we have to turn out our base. And a big part of that in the Democratic Party is a coalition. And I think a lot of that, too, is telling the truth. Now, there are different truths that compel different uh, on issues, right? Some people are really moved on how much their property taxes are going to be to speak to the suburban issue. Some people are really moved on foreign policy issues. Some people are very much moved on immigration. But I do think that there is a moving away, um, at least in terms of those who are running for office from trying to both sides everything. But it really is a, a, a major issue because yes. when we talk about equivocating between two things that are not, that are in no way comparable, it is dishonest. And it, it runs to me contrary to what the spirit of journalism is, which is trying to get to the truth of the matter. And sometimes that means one person is more right than the other. And it doesn't make you biased. It, it, mean, it means that we checked everyone's claims and one person maybe was not as honest or not as grounded as the other. Yeah, there's, no, there's not two sides to Holocaust denial or climate change denial or election denial. And uh, that absurdism is what ha we've paved the way. There's been this, this yes, momentum that's paved the way to that because of, of that practice. So one thing Zateo will never do is both sides journalism, I can assure you. We're going to stick to what is true. Uh, we're not going to say hot is cold, up is down, black is white, that's for sure. Um, we're out of time. Thank you so much to Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um,